have, of course, been projects that have touched on both concepts, but as far as we know, um, we really have pioneered this new model and proved our concept on an absolutely iconic, internationally important site. So, in spite of the success of the project, we are left with a few questions of our own. Is this truly a model for the future, or was it an unrepeatable experiment? With that in mind, I've structured this presentation as an informal discussion of the context, results, conditions, limitations, and repeatability of the project. We are as interested to find out about what you all think of what we've done as you are to hear about how we did it. So we know what happened, but we don't really know what could potentially happen in the future with the model, and not only for us, but for other projects that will potentially give this kind of work a go. So I'll welcome questions at any <coughs> point. Just stop me and ask. Right. Um, so we'll be talking about context, the project, results, challenges, and questions. What you see there is a crowdsourced uh, version of FlagFed. <coughs> if we had been better at it, we might have been actually able to spell libs as well, but there you go. <laughs> um, what is crowdfunding? Uh, crowdfunding, uh, contrary to popular opinion, is not uh, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This is one of my favorite pictures from FlagFed. It's an actual picture taken by one of our uh, ventures uh, on one of the last days of the dig. Um, very briefly, because I know a lot of you are familiar with it, there are four different ways of doing it. We were a reward-based crowdfunding project. There are two different ways at the minute of running your campaign on platforms, which is that you can raise all the money um, or keep none of it, or that you can keep as much as you've raised, which is the, the model that we went with. Luckily, we um, raised all the money and then some. But um, the cost associated with that is you, you pay 4% of your total if you do reach your goal. If you don't, you pay 9%. And that's really to help keep people motivated, keep pushing the campaign, and to not run out of steam. And you pay, you pay that money to your crowdfunding platform. In our case, we used a company um, called Sponsoon. And so what I want to say here is, you, you know, you're not reaching your hands out to the internet and pulling money out of it. You know, it's, it's not the same thing as just opening up a storefront. It is a marketing exercise, and it, it requires, you know, a lot of commitment. The difference between crowdfunding and crowdsourcing um, crowdsourcing is really about the bodies. Um, here you have a, a great quote from when the concept was first introduced. What it meant for us is it was a, we drew our labor force to dig the site actually from the people who funded us. If we just wanted people, we could have you know, put out a call for a flash mob you know, to come and dig our site um, in between you know, doing gang style moves or something, but that's not what we wanted. Um, we wanted to engage with the people who were funding us in a different way. We wanted to give them some kind of an ownership over, over what they had actually funded. So you know, we were we were actually looking to take that online uh, relationship into an offline experience. So this is a little bit about Dig Ventures. Um, one of the things I wanted to say initially was that you know um, this has been a, a pretty wild ride and so far a pretty short one. We launched it around this time last year, incorporated as a company. Um, in the first bullet point, I know the word private will make a lot of you flinch, but uh, in what we're trying to do, all that really means is that it gives everyone a chance to be involved. Um, it's it's open. We you know collaboration and being radically open is is fundamental to what we're doing. Um, for example, we're using the Arc system developed by uh, LP Archaeology, which is the archaeological recording kit. It is a uh, web-based recording system, and that enables us with with having some of our team. Um, we digitally record on site. It hasn't re yet replaced context sheets for us, but it probably will do. And when we have you know diggers and and staff that are living you know, in vastly different parts of the country and sometimes in our case in the world, they can they can, you know, look into it at any point and they can continue to do their work without actually needing to be in front of the physical records themselves. So we you know we have a web architect in Cornwall, we have team members all over the UK, our designer is in Ireland and uh, our videographers are in Australia. So everything that we do except for digging the site is digital. We, the context within which we're working is a model that we're calling social contract archaeology. Um, again, you can see you can see the definition there. But but what we what social contract means to us is that the relationship that we have with our funders is built on trust, and you, you really get one chance to engage with these people, uh, you know, through through the, the vehicle of the internet. And if you break that trust and you don't deliver what you promised, you know, that's that's the end of your project. So in reward-based crowdfunding, what the social contract means is the delivery promise that you've made. And that's everything from you, what you said you're going to do with your online platform to what you said you're going to do with people on site. 
So for us, um, the uh, typical engagement loop actually looks like spectrum. <coughs> Our entire point of contact with the world and to start this project was the one click. Uh, there's a lot of argument uh, lately about what is the actual value of someone liking you or a one click and being involved with you. Well, for us, without that one click, we just wouldn't have had a project. So as it says here, it's in our it's on our DNA. Taking those online relationships off offline was um, essential for us. And for those of you who aren't familiar with how we structured our benefits, um, everybody who funded us up to about 100 pounds was an online only member. <coughs> At 125 pounds and above you could join us on site. So that's how it worked. Um, our, our spectrum of engagement was also designed to encourage depth of engagement. So if you came with us for a day and you wanted to stay for two days or for a week or, or for two weeks or three weeks, there was a graduating return on your investment in that you were getting uh, greater levels of um, marketable archaeological field skills. Uh, eventually, you know, graduating people towards ownership, which for us means that we have a tribe of people out there now um, who are who are engaging with this project at whatever level they they feel comfortable. Um, so, in getting ready for the launch, um, as the HLF said yesterday, we spent a lot of time understanding our target market, um, which we call the Susie Thomas 200,000, which basically means um, you know Susie's research from CBA show that there are 200,000 people who um, self-identify as being members of archaeological or history societies. They're armchair and frustrated archaeologists. You know, the, we hear a lot of people who say, oh, I wanted to be an archaeologist, but you know, mom and dad wouldn't let me, or I decided to be an accountant instead. You know, those people have a continuing interest in archaeology, all the way up to people like the director of the Royal Opera House, who one day had the um, interesting conversation with me, telling me that he envied me my job. So, um, we also looked at uh, tourism things like the rise in staycationing um, and the, the rise of the experience economy, which is the red letter days, the Groupons, and the voucher type things. This has just taken off lately. And um, we thought, you know, why can't there be a heritage offer in that as well? So um, these, these people are all consumers of digital to a certain point. But, but where, how much, and, and what does you know, the digital that they consume actually look like? They want to be fun. They want to have fun and they want to be entertained. So we knew that we needed to tap into that if we were going to get beyond the people who would automatically want to do uh, something like this. And it's important to remember that, that digital is everywhere. And it's not about making everything you do digital. It's about, it's about dealing with the fact that, there's, that digital is everywhere. What people want to experience about archaeology is still very visceral. So in building an online and offline experience, we have to somehow make sure, or at least attempt, to, to bring that visceral experience that people want to have with archaeology across, across both areas. So um, we talked a lot about identity yesterday and voice, and we approached our corporate identity, you know, we're very serious about it. We spent a lot of time thinking about how we wanted to appear in the world. And this was our launch <laughs> party. <laughs> so we thought, we might as well start as we mean to go on. Um, but uh, we definitely wanted to to bring some fun into what we were doing. We think it's fun. It, it's important to, I think, communicate that if we do want to get out of the echo chamber that we, in archaeology, can sometimes you know, be limited to. We were not talking with our launch marketing and our website. We were not talking to other archaeologists. That was a deliberate move on our part. And you know, we, we took some heat for it. And that's fine. We expected it. But the people that we wanted to talk to were, were thankfully you know, able to engage with the tools that we put there because we were choosing to speak uh, a different kind of language. So in the beginning, uh, we had questions and problems like death and taxes, it's two things you can always count on. Um, it's not getting any easier to be an archaeologist or to do archaeology. So this project initially was a response to that. Um, there was an internationally important site with a failing visitor attraction. The archaeology is drying out, it's under threat. It's a very compelling story. Um, so we had that, we had the research question, and we had some very active stakeholders, one of whom see there. Um, and I put the word celebrity across that slide, you know, sort of tongue in cheek, but it's true. You know, having someone like Francis behind the project and also one of our team members being, you know, one of the time team archaeologists was a huge boost, boost for us. And, you know, that's part of what may or may not be a, a, the, the factors that make this um, applicable to other kinds of projects. <coughs> we also had a budget, um, and I have a question mark there because we, we raised 27,000 pounds for this project. The budget was 25. But in real terms, what it should have cost, if we were all getting our day rates or um, or not getting as much value in kind as we got, is around is around 130,000 pounds. This is what we we did: the campaign overview. 
We launched on the 29th of February, raised over 27,000 pounds. We sold out at se several of our benefit levels, which was a real surprise for us. We thought people would go for the lower levels for the digital stuff. They wanted to be on site. <clears throat> few more uh, details. We have over 250 people as what we call venturers, 11 countries. It's a really good spread. We, we'd like to see that get even bigger in the future. This is a great slide just showing some of the um, some of the folks who came to see us every day. This is pretty indicative of what it looked like trench side. Um, I just wanted to say a word about <coughs> 2,000 visitors to Flag Fen. I mean, uh, up against the Olympics in the first decent weather of the year, I don't know if you guys remember, it was rain, 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 summer. And so the Lido down the road from Flag Fen on the first week of our dig, at the first week of the Olympics, was getting 5,000 people a day. And even still, within within those three weeks, we managed to get their visitor numbers up over 29%. And you know, that's that's an amazing result. Amazing. Really pleased with that. So these, um, who, who were the people that funded us? Well, this is the spread. Um, just over 50% were digital only participants, which, you know, is, is tremendous. And, and I think that's a factor of our international reach and people who couldn't actually be on site, but also people thinking about consuming information in a different way. Um, what these basically mean, digital participation, again, people only uh, interacting with us on the web. What we're calling tri participation is people who came for a day or a weekend, learn participation, are people who actually participated in the field school for a week, two weeks, or three weeks. We had a lot of these triers. We had a lot of people who said, I always wanted to give this a shot, and I, I never knew, there was never anywhere for me to go, or nothing, nowhere that I could try, which was quite interesting considering how many local archaeological societies out there and, and local projects there are out there, that somehow that's just not getting out as a reasonable um, opportunity. And you know, we had lots of people that had been bought them as birthday presents or other kinds of gifts. Um, which is, is actually exactly what you know we want to see. And, and just before I go any further into the stats, um, we are very curious to learn more about the people who funded us, um, to see if there's any difference between them and the usual suspects of crowdsourcing participants. Um, and all, all that kind of understanding is important to our future growth. Um, but we really needed to take a step back at the end of the project and, and, and understand and be thoughtful about how we actually want to mine this data. So there are some stats and some deeper looks you know, coming, but it's, it's not as far as we can go, and, and, we, and we hope to you know, keep looking at that stuff in the future. This slide is very important, um, because how people found out about us still is word of mouth. I mean, I think that says a lot about how, just how far social media and things like that can go um, for a web-only campaign, <coughs> a huge thing. Um, and again, this represents us its on-site venture demographics. So this particular slide is just looking at the people who actually joined us on site. I'm not sure that that uh, can be replicated or would be the same if we surveyed all of the people who funded us, which obviously we hope to do in the future. Right, um, where were they from? And then we have also a worldwide spread love to see a lot more dots on the map. And actually in Australia, the one point <coughs> at the bottom, she came and joined us for three weeks, and the guy on the coast of Australia is already pressuring us to get the dates out for next year. Um, and this is what um, what it looked like for, for the site itself. And the visitors. Um, Flight Fen has had a real dip in visitors. They went from an all-time high of 20,000 when Francis was there to just under 8,000 people <coughs> last year. So it was important to, to start beefing that up again. It's, it's nice to see so many people from the local area. So how do we do it? Um, this came from, the, the big four ideas came from a presentation um, by Victoria Westcott, no relation, called Crowdfunding 101 on TEDx. And I really recommend that you have a look at that because she does lay it out for you in such a way that you can understand how to apply that to your own project if you're interested in going. Make something awesome, sell it directly to your audience. <coughs> Don't ask for charity, people do not like to be asked for charity. Give value for what, for what you're trying to raise money for and follow through and you might get what she calls tips, which are extras. Um, and in our, in our case, make something awesome, you know, sell it directly to your audience, don't ask for charity, follow through. It, it, worked, it worked very well for us. So um, those would be the four biggest points that, that I would recommend you think about when you look at your own project, if you want to try this, and you're thinking about how, how to have a go at it. Um, 
In building our venture community, we knew, without a doubt, it was we had to go way beyond our first and second circle. That's getting out of the echo chamber. And we knew that we needed to look outside archaeology for, for inspiration about how to do this. In my other life, I was uh, working for LOCOG on the Cultural Olympiad as project manager for the evaluation. And I was there as a spy, seeing how all these arts and culture people talk to their audiences. And I was taking that information in, and I was applying it to what we were trying to do. It is a different world, you know, they, they're different. And I think that heritage really has a lot to learn um, in terms of how people sell culture and the kinds of language they use and the kinds of motivators that they use to, to take people into what they're doing. For us, we, spoke, we focused on aspiration. This was internationally important research that we were doing. We focused on engagement, building our tribe, value, a return on the investment for our customers, and reach, uh, building that robust online platform. Um, how did we do it? Well, <laughs> that's what our media spread looked like. Um, so it was uh, pretty, pretty well uh, covered. We were on social media, uh, we were on traditional media, we were local, regional, national, um, you name it. And actually all the ventures that, that came to dig with us had to sign a social media contract on the first day which was just an agreement that, that we made, it's not legally enforceable, about how, how they were going to conduct themselves online when they were you know, part of the project. And what we saw coming through in the tweets is people really taking ownership of the work that they were doing and starting to upload to Flickr directly. Um, and that was great, absolutely great. Um, reinforcing the message. I don't believe that you have to be on social media all the time to have an effective uh, digital identity. It's about tweeting smarter or posting smarter. It's about really focusing on your content. Because um, it, it isn't maintainable. And what we've been talking about you know, over the last couple of days is not having the time to do that, not having the resource to do that, not, not, not having that being you know, an institutional uh, priority. But you have to keep inviting people to join you. You have to keep giving them different in and out points. So the way that we did that was focusing on cut through moments, you know, key themes, key happenings, and the dog, you know, which was incredibly successful for us really turned him into a monster now, he's a diva. Um, a like is, <laughs> is not necessarily enough um, when it comes to growing your tribe. Um, consumers are evolving, you know, their, their habits are driving technology as much as technology is changing in, as a response, you know, in, in, is changing their consumption habits. They, they will evolve, I think, to a point where a digital only offer and heritage um, would be enough. At the moment, that's not necessarily right for a business, and I don't think, you know, that we're really there. Um, and it's, it's important, I think, to, to do wide, you know, broadcast messages, but also really pay attention to the, those personal contacts and follow up with people to, re, to respond when people contact you directly. And that does take time. But, you know, now that we're all carrying the, the tools to do that in our pockets, it's not that hard. How many do for time? Okay, cool. I'm almost there. Um, again, just learning a little bit more about what um, people were learning and how they felt about being with us on site. Um, and these slides will be available afterwards. It's probably better for you to have a, a look at them then. Challenges, fulfillment. You have to deliver everything that you've promised people. You will only get one chance. Um, time. A successful <coughs> social media campaign is equivalent to excavating a complex trench. Um, can be seen as an unacceptable draw on, on resources, but for us, we factor it in from the design stage. Narratives, um, and then, of course, the Rumsfeldian unknown unknowns. Can we do it again? Don't know. Uh, there's a lot of factors in that. Um, how big is the market? Is it a limitless market, or is there, you know, people just want to try it once, and that's going to be it? And working with other funders, you know, crowdfunding cannot stand alone at this level. James Dozer said yesterday that we're pushing at an open door. I'm not so sure uh, that I necessarily believe that at the minute. It would be great if it was, and we'll certainly keep trying. And then that's it. <laughs>